I worship you, Lord Jesus. I worship you, Lord Jesus. Praise God. God bless you, and you may be seated. Would someone come to the organ, please? I want to sing that chorus, To Be Like Jesus. That seems to be the theme of our hearts here today, this entire conference. Praise God. I believe that is a sincere request of our hearts, to be like the Lord. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Would you sing it with me and help me lead it if you can? you lift your hands and let's really talk to the Lord I love you Lord Jesus and I praise you Almighty God I worship you I honor you Lord I adore you Lord Jesus thank you Lord Jesus thank you Lord Jesus thank you Lord Jesus, you, Lord Jesus. praise be thy matchless holy name. Hallelujah! 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 Glory to God! Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Will you just turn to a neighbor and lay your hands upon them? And let's pray for each other right now. Would you do it? Let's just pray for each other right now. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, blessed be thy matchless holy name. I worship you, Lord Jesus, and I adore you, Almighty God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to thy name. Glory to thy name. Glory to thy name, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I thank you, Lord Jesus. I thank you, Lord Jesus. Ida bahashia talaba kotala mahanda ya. Uya la bahashia talaba kata ya. Nada la bahia te te la bahasiya. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. God bless you and you may be seated. Surely the presence of God has been so great. In this meeting we have heard from the Lord today. I just could not tear myself away. I, I had some exceedingly urgent things to take care of today. But uh, I haven't left this place. I just felt that I had to be right here and would just lean on the Lord to help me <laughs> to do what I should have already done. <laughs> I feel myself personally, I feel like I have heard from the Lord today. From the early service all day. Praise God. We're wanting to do His will. We're desiring to be what God would have us to be. Amen. I'm thoroughly convinced that uh, uh, whether we succeed or fail, if we win or lose, it is dependent on how we keep our hearts. It's how we keep our hearts. That is the thing. Rarely do we fail because we are lazy, because we are not a lazy people we are not a lazy people and rarely do we fail because of the lack of power we have the power of God with us in a very marvelous and wonderful way but it is very possible for us to fail because we're not thinking right because we're not thinking right that is in fact the tremendous power of Satan is to interject thought into our minds. Amen. Satan is not even a warrior. You know, the Bible speaks of three cherubs. There are many angels, but there's only three cherubs. There was, there was Gabriel, who was a messenger, and there was Michael, who was the warrior, and there was Lucifer, who was a singer. His, the Bible teaches us that his voice was like the voice of an organ. And his ability and power is to speak. And he's been around a long time. So he's had lots of experience. <laughs> he knows a lot. And his power is the power to speak to us. Amen. The newest saint in the church that is filled with the Holy Ghost has more power than the devil has. Amen. We are constantly concerned about his power. Constantly concerned about his power that we have so exalted him and built him up as being so powerful. He is not all that powerful. He is smart. And he has the ability to speak to us. Even if you've been in the church a long time. Even if you're a marvelous, wonderful saint of God. If you're a very successful, effective minister of God, he has the power to interject a thought into your mind. And that is the extent of his power. He can't even organize his own system. Someone said that we ought to be united together because Satan's system is united. That is not true. That is absolutely not true. 
his kingdom is divided very divided that's the reason why there is no world empire in the world today as long as there was no church on several occasions he was able to unite his kingdom for a short period of time and the way you know what's going on in the spirit world is that the government of the world in human life will reflect what is going on in the spirit world it's very easy to tell what the spirit world is doing because the government of every nation cannot resist the power of the devil and so they reflect what he's doing <laughs> amen and he was able to organize his system and bring about a reflection of that in world governments he's been able to do it several times first of all there was the Assyrian Empire and then the Egyptian Empire and then the Babylonians and the Medes and the Persians the Greeks and the Romans six times that's the reason why the beast that represents the false world government is seven-headed because he's going to be able he's already done it six times and he's going to be able to do it one more time under the leadership of the false Christ the Antichrist he will do it again but I want you to know that the six times he's already done it was before the church came and he's not going to do it again until the Lord takes the church out of here <laughs> the last world empire collapsed when the church came because the world empire has to have a united spiritual satanic force behind it or it cannot exist and there has been none since the coming of the church and the reason is is because he that is within me and he that's within you is greater than he that's in the world Praise God! <laughs> we have power over him! Someone said to me one time, Brother Cole, aren't you afraid to attack the devil? Absolutely not! Let me tell you something, he scared the death of me! And that is not arrogance, that is knowledge! <laughs> Praise the Lord! <laughs> Someone said, Brother Cole, you attacked in the devil that way, you liable to fall off of that platform and break your leg. If I do, it wasn't the devil done it. It's just because I'm too fat and awkward. And the devil had nothing to do with it. <laughs> That's right. It's exactly right. One time Jesus came upon a man that was possessed with a legion of devils. Now that's a lot of them. I went to a church one time and a very, very precious saint of God and I don't mean to ridicule her at all but she was relating to me this testimony of casting six devils out of a woman. She, a young woman had come into the church and she threw herself on the floor and tore her clothes and tore her hair and she vomited and retched and frothed at the mouth and obviously possessed of the devil and she said to me brother Cole we cast six devils out of that woman and God gave her the Holy Ghost well now I believe that they cast the devil out of her and I believe that God gave that woman the Holy Ghost but I don't believe that there are six devils in the world that could cause a human being to do that they don't have enough power to do it what they did they didn't cast six devils out of that woman they probably cast six thousand of them out of that woman
You see, you can't see them. And they take full advantage of that. They take full advantage of you not being able to see them. <laughs> and they gang up in great force by thousands and they'll whisper to you because they have the ability to interject a thought in your mind. And they'll say, now there's just one of us. When there'll be thousands of them. You know what I believe? I believe that every sinner that comes to your altar is possessed of the devil. But they are not possessed with enough of them to cause them to physically demonstrate. And that the church has so much power over the devil that they cast devils out of people and do it so easy they didn't even know they'd done it. And the devil sure isn't going to tell you he done it. That you done it. <laughs> He's going to keep all that a secret. You know, let a little something go wrong in the church. And we, we call on the telephones until the telephone pole catch on fire. <laughs> Telling the whole world what's went wrong. Plenty of things can go wrong and the devil will never tell it. He'll never reveal that secret. <laughs> <laughs> that's right and Jesus came upon a man that was possessed with a legion of devils and I've, I've read commentaries where someone said that was 10,000 I've read commentaries where it said it was as little as 5,000 so I'll be conservative today and say that man was possessed with 5,000 devils and they were killer devils how you know, Brother Cole, because when Jesus cast them out, they went into 2,000 pigs. So I know there was more than 2,000. Had to be at least 2,000 of them, because they went into 2,000 pigs. And just as soon as those devils possessed those pigs, they run headlong straight into the water and committed suicide. So 5,000 of them was trying to kill one single unsaved man and couldn't do it. Now, you put the Holy Ghost in that man and five million of them couldn't do it. Five million of them couldn't do it. Hallelujah! I'm not afraid of the devil! I have authority over him. I have authority over him. But I'm constantly aware that he does have a source of power. And that is that he can interject a thought into my mind now he can't hurt me he cannot harm me there is nothing that the devil can do to me but he can interject a thought into my mind that will cause me to self-destruct that will cause me to destroy myself amen Praise the Lord. <laughs> it's true whether you believe it or not. <laughs> and this mind of ours is very powerful. One good mind is more powerful than 10 million devils. <laughs> the mind is powerful. You can get the wrong thought in your mind and it can cause you to have severe pain when nothing is wrong with your body. I don't know if you folks know my dear friend Charlie Mahaney or not. I love him. I have confidence in him. I think he's a, I think he's a real Christian. He's a, I love to hear him preach. But outside of the pulpit... <laughs> He is something else. He loves to tease. 
and joke. He teases me mercilessly. He was with me one day and he teased me until I was driving the wrong way on one race streets, <laughs> driving up on curves. <laughs> we went out to go to church and got in the car and I said, now Charlie, it's exactly 20 minutes from my driveway to the church and I don't want you to say one single word to me so my mind can rest. <laughs> and he didn't. He just sat over there and grinned at me for 20 minutes. <laughs> he wanted to buy some shoes, so I took him to a place where they were real reasonable, and he bought several pairs of shoes. And uh, back in those days, uh, you know, when you, I had one of those trunks that you had to slam down, you know. And... Uh, I opened that trunk for him to put his shoes in and I slammed that trunk just it was kind of hard to close so I slammed it down real hard and when I did he went Ow! and I thought oh my god I have mashed his hand and I felt pain from the top of my head to the sole of my feet <laughs> And then he went, hey, 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 <laughs> And I wanted to mash him in the nose with my fist. <laughs> if I would have destroyed his hand, it would not have hurt me more than it did. My mind told me I had mashed my guest speaker's hand. And I felt pain. The mind is powerful. The mind can cause you to have sorrow when you should not have it. When those brothers came home and told Joseph's father, they didn't tell him anything. All they did was show him Joseph's coat that had been dipped in a lamb's blood. They didn't even say that Joseph is dead. They didn't say Joseph has been killed. They simply showed their father that coat and his hair turned white overnight. Sorrow. There is no way that Joseph's father could have had any more sorrow if Joseph was genuinely dead. His mind. Powerful. I read in a medical magazine picked it up on a plane one day and read of a child that became very sick in an elementary school in a general assembly. It was a school that was near Harvard University. And that child just fainted very, very sick. And it wasn't long until 50 children had fainted. And they rushed all these kids to the hospital and the one that fainted first was genuinely sick. The rest of them recovered very quickly and these the school staff was terrified thinking there might be poison in the food or in the water or something and they realized that it was just nothing but mass hysteria that had caught these children genuinely fainted and it was mass hysteria the power of the mind I remember one time when I was in the Philippines and we was touring among the churches and we was going into a very very primitive area kind of a uh, don't believe it was jungle but it was very dense forest and it was just a dirt highway dirt road not very wide uh, kind of a one car lane type thing and we were in a jeep four-wheel drive jeep and up ahead of us was this humongous snake it was a python snake I don't know if you're familiar with them or not but it was at least and I'm not exaggerating it was at least that big around and that's a big snake <laughs> and he stretched clear across the road and they immediately stopped and they all got out of the car except me <laughs> they wanted to see that snake and they tried it to persuade me and they said brother Cole it can't hurt you it's not poison even if it bites you it wouldn't hurt you 
I said, I don't even want a chicken biting me, let alone a python snake. <laughs> and he said, the only way it could hurt you is if they wrap around you and squeeze. And he said, he's not long enough to reach around you. <laughs> and I said, that snake may not be able to hurt me, but it's about to make me kill myself. <laughs> and that is the power of the devil. Right there, in a nutshell. That is the power of the devil. He cannot hurt you. He cannot harm you. The devil has never, ever split a church. Never. The devil has never split a church. He has simply interjected a thought in someone that was very strong flesh and got them crossways in that church and flesh split that church. The devil's not powerful enough to do it. I was sitting on a platform one time in a meeting such as this <laughs> and the song service was already over and a lady walked through the doors back there and the pastor leaned over to me, the host pastor leaned over to me and said, that woman is full of the devil. I said, well, good. <laughs> if she's full of the devil, we can take care of her in 10 seconds. But if it's flesh, it'll take you 20 years to straighten her out. And what we need to learn in the church is to be able to discern when something is genuinely devil power and when it is flesh power. And the district of Wisconsin is not going to be bucking up against devil power. As I told you last night, as an authority from the Lord, the back of Satan has been broken in the district of Wisconsin by your intercessors. You can have revival. You can have revival. But you're going to have to cope with flesh power. Indoctrination. Catholicism. Lutheranism, custom, praise the Lord, amen, and the Lord is able to help us with that, I said the Lord is able to help us with that, amen, <laughs> I remember one time in going to Ceylon, and it used to be Ceylon, now it's called Sri Lanka. Just a little island nation off of the south end of India. And uh, the church was very, very small in those days. Thank God for the great revival in Sri Lanka. Under the leadership of Brother Prince Matthias, there has been thousands come into the kingdom of God. Can you say praise the Lord? I was preaching in Stuttgart University and he was a student there in Stuttgart University and God filled him with the Holy Ghost and he went back to his own country and God has given great revival in that nation. Praise the Lord. And, uh, but this was long ago and the, the missionaries were forced out of Sri Lanka because of the uh, World War II and so forth. And the church, uh, they were so precious. Don't you misunderstand me? The members of the church were so precious. But they had, they had not had leadership. They had not had teaching. And they had got into a lot of things. And they, uh, they were very small. We were having a conference. And there was just about a hundred people. And just about everybody in the nation that was in the church was... Uh, almost all of them were there. That was just about the extent of the whole church in the nation in those days. And uh, they were sitting in a large house on the floor. No chairs. The only chairs they had was there for me and Brother Sism. And thank God they had one for me. <laughs> I sit on the floor. It paralyzes me from my chest down. <laughs> and, uh, and I got up to preach. And just as I started to preach, there was a, a, a young woman about 20 years old right in the middle 
that suddenly just fell over on the floor, stiff as a tuba six. And uh, they instantly determined that she was possessed of the devil. And the people just scattered like, like a shotgun to the walls. They were afraid. They were very afraid. <laughs> very, very afraid. And there was only five Silanese preachers, and they were afraid. And I'm not ridiculing them, but they were afraid. But they were also very courageous. Oh, they were courageous. And they would run up to her and pray over her, and then they would run back. <laughs> because they were afraid. <laughs> but they would run again. They were, they were courageous. <laughs> and it was so hot, just in a few minutes, they were just literally saturated with their own perspiration. There wasn't a dry thread on them. <laughs> and finally, I told the assistant superintendent, who was also the interpreter, I said, would you let me handle this, please? And of course, he was very kind. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I really didn't say it that way. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to tell you what I said, because, uh, uh, you know, we Pentecostals, we love apostolic power, but we don't like apostolic methods. You all want us to act like we've been to Dale Carnegie's school of how to win friends and influence people? <laughs> if you don't know what I just said, the Lord didn't want you to know. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, I got his attention, and uh, he turned things over to me, and I said, uh, I want six ladies to pick that woman up. She was very beautiful. She had long black hair, and she had a beautiful dress all the way down to her sandals, and she just lay in there stiff as a tuba six. <laughs> and, and those women were afraid, but they were obedient, and they picked her up, and I said, now carry her into this room over here. And uh, then the preachers went with me and Brother Sism, and I told the interpreter, I said, now I want you to interpret every word I say. As I speak, you just interpret everything I say. And I went in there and I said, now this woman is very beautiful and she knows it and she's wanting our attention. She is not possessed of the devil. And this is the way we're going to handle her. We're going to lock this bedroom door and we're going to leave her in here two days without anything to drink or eat. And he's interpreting this. And when he interpreted that, she went, oh, boy, she got her healing just like you'd snapped your finger. <laughs> and Brother Sism said, oh, thank you, Brother Cole. One year ago, we prayed for that woman 36 hours without stopping. <laughs> flesh power you have to be able to discern what is the devil and what is flesh and many times your church is not growing it's not devil power many times it's flesh power and you can't cast flesh out not in our culture you cast flesh out in our culture and they'll put you in jail you have to educate flesh you have to teach flesh. You have to persuade flesh. <laughs> well, hallelujah. <laughs> and we can go through crises. We can go through things that we, we become so puzzled. We become so... Uh, the, the enemy will send things to confuse us. And cause us to self-destruct. Everybody say self-destruct. Self Amen. There is no telling what kind of a revival we would have in the United States of America if we could get our minds right. If we get our minds straight. We get our attitude straight. Praise the Lord. We've had a lot said about it in this conference already. And again, your superintendent spoke to us about it again this morning. And uh, how I appreciated what he had to say. I said amen in my heart to every word he said. And I know you did too. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
but the Lord will allow, or rather the, the enemy will cause divisions to come among us and confuse us and cause self-destruction unto us. In the scripture, let me read you this scripture first. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3, beginning with verse 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning with verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of the strongholds. Now verse 5 will tell you what the strongholds are. Casting down imagination. You know where the stronghold of the devil is? Right between her ears. <laughs> Casting down imagination and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought. Everybody say every thought. Every thought. To the obedience of Christ. Amen. If you can do that, you're going to enjoy great victory in the things of God. Hallelujah. His power is real. It's available to us. Can you say amen? amen. We concern ourselves with too many things and uh, take upon ourselves responsibilities that are really not ours. The Jesus one time used the parable of the prodigal son, of the father who had two sons, and one of them he just became weary with what was going on in the household. He didn't like the work schedule. Maybe he didn't like to work. I don't know. But he knew that his father was very rich and demanded his portion of the, of the inheritance and uh, of his living. And he wanted to leave in rebellion. He wanted to leave. And his father allowed him to do that. And he went away into a foreign country, Jesus said in this story that he told us, and uh, wasted all that he had in riotous living. He had so many friends until, until all of his money was gone. And then it was gone, and he became hungry, and he started job seeking. And even though he was a Jew, he ended up taking a job taking care of pigs and swine because he was so hungry the Bible says one day he was so hungry that he even considered eating uh, hog food he was so hungry he considered eating what they was feeding to the hogs he was right out there in the middle of them in the muck and the mire and the mud and the filth and the stink and the rot he was one filthy rotten mess Amen. And finally he came to his senses. And he said, I'll go home and apologize and repent to my father. And ask him and tell him that I'm not worthy to be his son. All I want to be is just his servant. And so he did. The important thing is that he knew his way home. Amen. Jesus used three parables there. One of the lost sheep. The lost sheep knew he was lost, didn't know how to get home, didn't know how to find himself. The Lord's coin was lost, didn't have any concept of being lost. Totally dependent on outside help. But the prodigal son knew his way home. So he made his way home. And the Bible teaches us that his father was waiting on him. Didn't go after him. Didn't chase him. But he welcomed him when he come home. Praise the Lord. Waited for him. I remember uh, when I was at, first went to Thailand the first term. I, my mother, some of you may have known her. She was the first international ladies auxiliary president. Sister Mary Cole was my mother. And she was so precious and dear to me. She was one of the most gentle people I have ever met in all of my life. And, uh, and we had a little thing between us. And uh, Thailand was exactly 12 hours away from my hometown. 
When you went from my hometown, you could go east or you could go west. And it was exactly the same distance to Thailand. It was just halfway around the world. But we had a way of communication because every time the sun would sit in Thailand, my mother would see the sun rising in Parkersburg. And there was just uh, one moment a day that we could see the same object at the same time. Though we were a half a world away. And I can relate to a father being concerned for his son, waiting and waiting for him to come home. And there was that faithful brother that was there, continuing to do the work, punching the clock, so to speak, taking care of everything, and being the manager of the whole farm, and taking care of everything. Let me tell you what I see in this. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture of the church. When the church, there was a great, great outpouring of the Holy Ghost. And there was that element at the turn of the century that broke away. There was a falling away, a great falling away. And they began to compromise the message. But God has always had a faithful people. Always. Even during the Dark Ages, we read of the Huguenots in history that received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were slaughtered in France by the literal tens of thousands of them were slaughtered during the Dark Ages, baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. There's history all the way down through of, of God having faithful, faithful people. But there was those that wasted his inheritance and they lost the great treasures that God had given to them. It wasn't long until they had lost the beautiful, magnificent message of repentance. They lost the message of baptism in Jesus' name. They lost the message of the infilling of the Holy Ghost. They lost the message of holiness. They lost the message of modest apparel. And it wasn't long until they were totally, spiritually bankrupt as if they were in a foreign place, a foreign place altogether, a far country, and their inheritance was completely, totally gone. But God has always had a faithful people. The church has always been made up of those two segments, of people. Amen. Amen. Then so it is. And uh, there, when the... When the prodigal son came home and his father welcomed him, he did not welcome him because he was clean. He welcomed him because he came home. He was not clean. He was a filthy, stinking mess. Totally bankrupt. He didn't welcome him home because he was moral. He was immoral. He had wasted his inheritance with harlots and with riotous living. But his father welcomed him home. And there's a very deep spiritual application here. In recent years, we have seen the prodigal son coming home out of every denomination under the sun. And they are beginning to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost by the thousands and by the millions. Someone said, they're speaking in tongues of the devil. Let me warn you, sir, when you say that, 
You be careful lest you blaspheme the Holy Ghost. They're not what they ought to be, but they're coming home. The prodigal son wasn't what he ought to be, but he welcomed him home. And he threw a party for him. I mean, they were having a party. They were singing and dancing and having a time. They killed the fatted calf. And he cleaned him up and put a robe on him. Took away his nakedness and give him dignity. He put a ring on his finger that is a symbol of authority. And he put shoes on his feet. That is a symbol of peace. Having your feet shod with the preparation of gospel. Peace. Peace. Shoes are a symbol of peace. And we watch as the charismatic world develops. And they begin to receive the Holy Ghost. And it would seem that God is healing the sick. Ah, oh, Brother Cole. They do a lot of exaggeration. So don't we. Ah, Brother Cole, they have folks that fall into adultery. So don't we. Are you getting awful quiet on me now? <laughs> that used to make me nervous. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> well, I just don't understand these things that are happening, Brother Cole. Just so many blessings and my, you can go into some of their meetings. I never have. I have never in my life ever been to a charismatic meeting one single time in my life. I have never ever in a hotel or a church or an auditorium. I have never in my life ever been in a charismatic meeting one single time. I know I gotta love them, but it's hard for me. <laughs> I have to work at it. <laughs> I wish you could see what I see right now. Because <laughs> you don't know where I'm going. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and the elder brother heard the party. And he asked one of the servants, What's going on over there? I hear all that music and dancing. What's going on? He said, Haven't you heard your brothers come home? And the Bible says he was exceedingly angry. Angry. What's going on around this place? I have punched a clock every single day. I have been faithful to my father. I have been faithful to all of his commandments. The Bible says, I have kept every commandment. I have been faithful. I have been here all the time. I've crossed the T's and I've dotted the I's. I've repented. I've been baptized in Jesus' name. I spoke in tongues when I received the Holy Ghost. I have practiced holiness. I have practiced modest apparel. And what in the name of God is the Father doing? He was so angry. He was so angry. So very angry. And if we're not careful, I believe the United Pentecostal Church represents the faithful brother that has been faithful in all things and kept the commandments. And I know we don't like uh, liberal and conservative labels, but if, there, if I would be labeled, I would fall into the conservative side. Someone made the remark in my county, if you want to get in Brother Cole's church, you've got to go through the door sideways. I believe in holiness. I believe in modest apparel. I believe that if you're not baptized in Jesus' name, that you are not born again. 
If baptism in Jesus' name is not essential to the salvation of souls, we are the biggest troublemakers in the whole wide world. Praise the Lord. But though we may cross the T's and dot the I's, we have a very, very serious problem with our attitude. The reason we're not having the revival that we should have is not because of the lack of power. It's not because of the lack of source. It's because of the way we think. And when the father came out there and entreated the elder brother to come and join the party, rejoice with me. My God, we've been praying for years for these people to get the Holy Ghost. And when they start speaking in tongues, we get so mad we can't hardly see straight. <laughs> Lord, you're going to have to help me today. My God, <laughs> I'm into it up to my ears now. <laughs> the father did not entreat the elder brother to compromise. If the elder brother would have started acting like the younger brother, thinking this is what pleases the father, he would have broken the father's heart. He would have literally broke the father's heart. And unfortunately the devil sends issues among us and confuses us and gets our minds in such a turmoil that we can't have revival. All we got to do is fight over issues. Amen. Amen. I have made up my mind, I don't care who goes, who stays, I'm going to try to preach what I believe to be the Word of God. I cannot base what I preach on experience. I've got to base what I preach on this book. Whatever this book says, I've got to preach it. I wish it wasn't in there about women not cutting their hair. I wish it wasn't in there, but it's in there. And because it is in there, I'm going to preach it. Now, I can't make women stop cutting their hair, but I can keep them off of my platform. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. I have made up my mind that I am not going to compromise. But I'm also made up my mind I'm going to quit hating people that don't line up to everything I teach. We have got to somehow realize that there is a difference between love and compromise. I can love people without compromising with them. And I don't understand everything the Lord is doing. I don't understand why those people out there have so much money. And my, my church has to sell peanut brittle. I don't understand that. But I've made up my mind I'm going to hold study on the truth. I'm going to preach the truth. I'm going to live what the Bible teaches to the best of my ability. Hallelujah. <laughs> Time to laugh, Billy Cole. <laughs> God wants to speak to us. There is absolutely nothing the devil can do to the United Pentecostal Church except interject a little thought into our mind and flesh rises up and then the big fight starts and the revival is over it's just that simple it's just that simple praise the Lord 
Praise the Lord. Oh God, speak to us today. God, speak to us today. God, heal our minds today. God, heal my mind today. Help me to think right. This is not flattery. This is not flattery. But I think that one of the reasons this district is so blessed and because there's such an attitude in this conference, it's not everywhere, is because I think your superintendent comes as near thinking like God as any man I know in the world. Attitude, 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 attitude. God help us to think right. Let me remind you folks that are being faithful. The father came and entreated his son. And he said, you didn't kill a fatted calf for me. He said, why son, everything I got is yours. Even that calf I killed for him belonged to you. What does it mean? It means that he's getting the party and you get the inheritance. This thing is not over yet. This thing is not over yet. We're going to get the inheritance if we'll be faithful. We have got to be faithful. But we've got to stop hating. 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 Amen. Lord, help us to think right. Lord, help us to think right. There's no telling what kind of revival that this district of Wisconsin could have if we could grasp what has been said in this conference and apply it to our hearts and minds. God wants to do great things among us. Do you believe it? If you really believe it, would you stand and lift your hands and let's really praise him for it by faith. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I worship you. I honor you. I adore you. You know, years ago the church, by the anointing of the Holy Ghost, chose to speak against smoking cigarettes. There's nothing in the Bible that says don't smoke. And the stuff that we've used out of the Bible to speak against cigarettes is we have twisted the scripture like you wouldn't believe. We had to do something, you know because you all make us but the Holy Ghost led us and now you thank God that you haven't been smoking can you say amen it was the Holy Ghost that led us and everything is not a heaven or hell issue the first thing some people want to know well if I do that will I go to hell that's not the issue. I, I don't want to just make it in by the skin of my teeth, so to speak. I don't want to do everything that I possibly can do and make it. I want to please the Father. I want to find out what He likes. I want to find out what He likes. And He don't like fig leaves. He don't like bikinis. He put a coat on him. 
Praise the Lord. Praise God. There's so many things that my wife likes, and I adore my wife. She is so marvelous. She is just one of the most splendid women that ever lived in all the earth. And she loves me so much, she even thinks I'm good looking. <laughs> and there are a lot of things that I could do that would displease her. She wouldn't divorce me because of it. But because I love her, I have found out what she likes. And I do it just because she likes it and I love her. Now, my wife is a very sound sleeper. When she goes to sleep, she just goes off into some other world somewhere. She just, like she's dead. And she's hard to wake up. <laughs> Once she gets up, she's good till midnight. She just go all day, you know, but it's hard to wake her up. And in Thailand, we used to have to get up at 5 a.m. in the morning. And I learned, she loves coffee. I don't know if that's sin or not, but uh, she loves coffee. <laughs> Must not be y'all serving it over here. <laughs> she loves coffee. And I got up over 30 years ago, I started making her coffee and carrying her to her it, when she's still in bed. And I would say, wake up, wake up. You know, like that, I say, wake up, baby. <laughs> Here's your cussie. <laughs> and she'll say, give me five more minutes. No, we got to get up now. She'll say, I can't hold it. My hand won't work. <laughs> so I, uh, I rub her hand. I massage her hand. Then she holds it. She says, I can't drink it. And I put pillows up under her, see. The other day, some time ago, I learned that it really thrilled her if I had just put my cologne on and a little bit of that cologne got on her cup. cup. That, that, really, that really pleased her. So I got me a bottle of cologne and set it right by the coffee pot. And when I take her a cup, I put a little bit of cologne on my finger and put it right on the top side of the cup. That's not, that's not a divorce or living together issue. I just learned that that pleased her. And because I love her, I do it. So I've made up my mind, I'm going to find out what pleases him. I don't care whether it's a heaven or hell issue or not. I'm just going to do it, because I love him. And I've also made up my mind, I've also made up my mind, that I'm not going to let you or anybody else intimidate me into hating somebody that doesn't. Aren't you glad for truth? Truth is a precious thing. Thank God for somebody that will still stand before us and tell us the truth. You know, not a famine for food in America. Maybe truth. People that will be bold and stand in the pulpit and tell us truth. Had a lady come to my office and she said, Please tell me what it's going to take to make it to heaven. Black and white. Write it down. This was Saturday. So give me a list of what you think it's going to take to get to heaven. That's really hard to do. When somebody's looking for black and white. And some of it's got to come in attitude. And spirit. And how you position yourself with God. You know makes it makes a big difference. And I don't want to get to heaven by just what I can't do and what I can do. 
But I want to do as Brother Cole said. I want to give it my very best. My very best. He deserves it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. 